Hi everybody and welcome back to our continued study in the life of Christ from our book One Perfect Life. Glad you're here. Last time we were together we had talked about the uh, Mount of Olives and the Olivet Discourse and how Jesus had explained to the disciples and answering the question how will we know when it's the time for you to become the king and and don't let us be surprised. And he went into great detail of explaining things that had to be very perplexing to them at the time. But as we look back on it today, based upon what Paul and, and John have taught us about the coming time of great tribulation and the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, uh, they tend to make more sense to us today. When I'm describing the future things that are yet to happen, I describe them from what's called a dispensational view. And more specifically, I'm explaining a pre-trib, pre-millennial dispensational point of view. And what I mean by that is when we take the writings of Paul, especially 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, and we take the writings of the book of Revelation, and we try to put all the pieces together it appears as though we have this time frame to look forward to. At any moment, there will be a shout. The church will be raptured or snatched away. Rapture is a word that's not seen in the Bible because that was the language that was developed later on. But it's a snatching away of the church. And in this snatching away of the church, it's what we come to understand as meeting Jesus in the sky. Then seven years of tribulation, the last three and a half years, are really bad times for those who believe and follow Jehovah, uh, looking for Jesus' return. At the end of that, Jesus returns. So pre-trib means that Jesus will come before the great tribulation to snatch away his church. Pre-millennial means that he'll come back again just before he sets his uh, thousand year reign into action. And what we see when Jesus explains is mostly talking about his actual return when he sets foot on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives splits. He enters Jerusalem again, and that's the beginning of a 1,000 year reign. So again, I'm going to summarize very fast. If the rapture happens tonight, then there'll be seven years of tribulation. Three and a half years will be very deceptive. The last three and a half years will be very terrible for those who reject the mark of the beast. At the end of that seven-year period, Jesus returns physically here on the earth. He defeats his enemies. He has a judgment where he separates people from all nations, whether they were faithful believers or not. And if they're not faithful believers uh, at that time, they will be thrown into torment, uh, awaiting their judgment and the people who are left here on earth will be what populates his thousand year millennial reign. Jesus will reign for a thousand years during that period of time. Satan will be bound. And then at the end of that thousand year period of peace, uh, what the song Joy to the World is all about, peace on earth. Um, at the end of that, Satan is loosed. He's given an opportunity to tempt mankind one more time. Those who don't want the reign of Jesus will then have the opportunity to choose against him. Then will be the final battle. And after that, this earth will be destroyed, this time by fire. A new atmosphere, heaven, and earth will be formed. There will be a judgment of all people who ever lived. And then after that, it will be living eternally with Jesus. So that's the future times. And that's what he's talking about in the Mount of Olives. So... In the first part of the Mount of Olives, he says, watch, watch, pay attention, be looking for my return. All believers are expected to be looking for Jesus's return, which leads us to a couple parables. Now, with these parables, notice he says likened to, and when he says likened to, he's saying, I'm giving you an illustration. This is not historic. Whenever we can, we try to understand the Bible as being historically accurate. But when he says likened to, he's saying, no, I'm telling you a story. In this case, you could say it's like a myth. This never happened, but I'm trying to teach a principle from this story. 
Now, don't think that applies anyplace else in the Bible unless he says like unto. All right, so here we go. We're on page 394, and we're about to get started. Let's ask the Lord to bless the reading of his word. Heavenly Father, we love you, and we thank you. And we're excited when we talk about uh, the return of your son, Jesus Christ, and we look forward to the rapturing of his church. We look forward, Father, to the return of your son, and we look forward to reigning with him forever and ever. Let us be found faithful. Now we ask that you give us wisdom and give us understanding as we study in your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray, and amen. Now, this comes from Matthew chapter 25, and that's where we'll be looking at the two uh, parables. Matthew 25. Here we go. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at the midnight's cry, they heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you. But go, rather, to sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding. And the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Now in this illustration, understanding the tradition of the time, when a man was betrothed to his up-and-coming wife, he would go and he would prepare a place for her. He would buy property or inherit property, set up a home, get everything ready. And when he was ready, he would send a messenger ahead. Because this may be months. It could be a year that he was getting ready. And when everything's ready, he would send a messenger, say, All right, get everything together. Get the food together. Get your dresses together. Call your bridal party together. I'm on my way. And then apparently, as in this story goes... As the bridegroom was coming, something happened to delay him. He didn't get there at the exact time that you would have expected. Now, I'm thinking if he said, hey, I'm going to be there this coming Friday, if that was his plan, he would have probably made arrangements to get there early in the day. So it would have been a whole day of festivities. But let's assume something happened and he was delayed and he didn't get there till midnight. Now, the food was ready, the bridal party was ready, the bride was ready, and they'd been sitting around all day long waiting for the bridegroom. It got to the midnight hour, and everybody was getting tired and sleepy, and, and maybe the, the ten uh, bridesmaids, uh, maybe five of them had used up their oil doing other things. I don't know, but, but they were not prepared to make the journey to where the um, the celebration would be held for the wedding. So at midnight, they were surprised, and they got the call. Well, hopefully the bride was ready, and five of the bridegrooms, they were ready, but five of them were not. It caught them off guard because the bridegroom didn't come when they thought that he would, and that's the whole point. In this lesson, we're learning. You don't know when he's coming back, so don't be found surprised. Always be looking for Jesus' return. Now, as I explained to you in the pre-trib way of looking at it, don't be surprised if the snatching away of the church, the rapture, if you will, the, in Latin, don't be surprised if that doesn't happen tonight or this afternoon or this evening or whenever the day is. Always be looking for him to return. And then more clearly is during the tribulation, those tribulation saints that have been faithful and they've been waiting and watching for Jesus to come and they know he's coming soon because they know it's a seven-year tribulation. That's, that's already been uh, documented. And you would think if they know exactly when it's coming, 
that they would not be surprised, but he says some will. And for those who are not prepared, for those who are not anticipating him. Now, all of them were surprised when he showed up. That's okay. It's not being prepared. So he says, live our lives continuously looking for his return, and especially for those tribulation saints. And of course, the outcome of it is they come to the bridal chambers where the ceremony is going on. And of course, it's, it's, a, it's got doors, an entranceway that have been locked. And they say, let us in. And the answer was, I never knew you. Now, that's very similar to uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Many will come saying, Lord, Lord, but not all those who say, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And when they say why, he says, because I never knew you. So it's easy for me to put together from this, the people who have a relationship with Jesus, that he knows them by an experiential relationship, they're watching. They're looking for him to come. Now, you don't earn your way to heaven because you're busy looking. You demonstrate to yourself and to others around you, you are one of the redeemed because you're consumed with talking about and looking for the return of Jesus. And I want to encourage you, class, do that. Try to make a habit every day to mention to somebody about Jesus' return and how you're looking forward to it. And I, I like joking with people on a beautiful, beautiful day. I say, you know what? I do believe this is exactly the kind of weather it'll be when Jesus comes back. And it'll be like this all the time when he's here, when we have peace. And I just look for any excuse to point out to people that's watching me that I'm anticipating Jesus to come back. And I know it's going to happen. All right, let's go to the next passage on page 395. Now, the first one, the first lesson was be ready. Be ready. This one is wasted opportunities. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. So in this story, again, never really happened, but it's a story that teaches a lesson. He's saying that he gave to three different servants according to their ability. He understood what their skill set was or what their past uh, abilities were, or maybe just the way he created them. You know, some are more gifted than others. And he said he gave according to their ability. Now, he knows your ability, too, and he won't give you more than what you can handle. I promise that. And then he went away, just like Jesus 2,000 years ago, he went away, due to return. Then he who had received the five talents went and he traded with them. He invested, he, he bartered, he brokered, and he made another five talents. And likewise, he who had gained the two, he did two more also. But he who had received the one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Now, this sounds very similar to the parable of the Minyas. And in the parable of the Minyas, it was 10, 5, and 1. And the story was practically identical. So he who had received five talents came, and he brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, and this is what you want to hear, at your judgment. You want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Now, I don't know exactly what it means. I'll make you ruler over many things, but I personally am convinced that when we reign with Jesus during the thousand year millennial reign here on earth, I think that we will be given a teaching responsibility, a leadership role in different geographic areas. And, and maybe that means that um, those who have been somewhat faithful will have a couple of cities that they are teaching and encouraging in. And maybe some will have five cities that they're a teacher and an encourager during that thousand year millennial reign. Regardless when it is, it's fun to speculate, but regardless when it is, he's going to use us in a way that glorifies him based upon you got it, our faithfulness. 
He also, who had two talents, came and said, Lord, you deliver to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents beside them. His Lord said to him the exact same answer. Look at this. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Now, that's good news because I know people that have got a lot of abilities that I don't have, that they can, uh, they have recall, or maybe they can speak in a way that's highly effective and desirable, and people just uh, desire to follow, or whatever the gifts may be. Some can sing in a special way, but it doesn't matter. He's not evaluating you on the gifts that he gave you. He's evaluating you based upon how you use what he gave you. So actually, the person with more gifts, more um, natural talents, if you will, that person has a higher standard that is expected out of them. So we just take what he gave us. We take what he gave us. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, and this is the sad part of the story, Lord, I knew you'd be a hard man. Oh, that's a dangerous statement to make. Reaping where you have not sown. Well, that's a worse statement to make to a creator God. And gathering where you have not scattered seed. Really? Where would that be? And I was afraid, I'd say he should be, and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there, you have what is yours. <laughs> I think there's another way to explain this person. I don't think this person liked the king. I don't think the person wanted the king to benefit from anything that he did and I think what he did was it was almost an in your face so I'll take what you gave me I'll stick it in the ground where it belongs and if you come back I'll give it right back to you and you can't accuse me of being a thief and you see this is the person that says I refuse to take the opportunities you've given me as my king and to glorify you and when you look at it that way that's really concerning I don't want you to be mistaken. When he says talents here, he's not talking about physical talents. Now, that's just a, that's just a, uh, a coincidence of the English use of the word. The word for talent here is money. There were talents of gold, there were talents of silver. He's not talking about physical attributes or, or mental abilities. That is not what he's talking about. He's talking about with the money I trusted you with. I've given you, I've given you money to work with. What did you do with it? And that really is the question. You know, with the money that I have. Now, it takes us back to the, um, the analogy, um, Jesus, should we pay taxes? And he said, well, whose name's on the money? Caesar's. Good. Give Caesar's what's Caesar's, but give to me what's mine. So what he's asking for is not your money. He's asking for your investment of what? all I've trusted you with. Let, let the government have the coins. But if I've trusted you with a house, what are you doing with the house? If I've trusted you with a car, what are you doing with the car? I think I could go even further and say, if I've trusted you with oxygen coming in, what forms do you make coming out? What words come out of your mouth? These are the things that I'm going to judge you by. And he compares them to a judgment by fire that things are wood, hay, and stubble, temporary stuff that after the fire consumes them, there's no evidence that they were even there. But things that are precious to the Lord, regarding eternal things, things that are precious, they'll remain, and for those things, you will be rewarded. So this person is clearly an enemy of God, and the king addresses that. But his Lord answered and said to him, and this, this is kind of like saying, so you claim that you knew that I was a wicked and, and, and bad leader. Here's what he says. You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown. Nah, he's not agreeing with that, at least not in the case of Jesus. But if you really felt that way and you, and you think that I gather where I have not scattered seed, so you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. Wouldn't have been much, but it would have been something. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given. 
and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant. Notice what he calls him. An unprofitable servant. You're of no value to me. Cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's only one other incident where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that is eternal torment in hell. Now that's a sobering thought. And I, I am not um, joyful in telling that at all. Because as a mere human, that's a sobering thought that, that makes me think twice about what I'm doing with what he has given me as well. But let's step back and let's really appreciate what he's saying. If first we will acknowledge the things that I have are a gift from you and you've enabled me to have them so I can glorify you, do I use them to glorify him? A person can say, well, I glorify him by taking care of my family. Well, there's a basic role of taking care of your family, but if he trusts you with anything in surplus, what would you do with that? Would it be for your hobbies or would it be for the furtherance of the kingdom? And you're going, well, preacher, are you saying that we can't have hobbies? No, we can't have hobbies, but you know where I'm going with this. It's when you sit back and you look at the balance of your life and all the things he's trusted you with, how much of it was a bare necessity to exist? You and your family exist in safety, of course, in safety. Um, how much of it was for your pleasure and joy and how much of it was for his glorification and it come to you at a cost a cost you invested time and you invested money into the furtherance of the kingdom of god and you want to be comfortable with that as you approach the judgment and here's the good news it's not too late to make an impact on that now that is what jesus was teaching right before he left now this is tuesday late afternoon, early evening of the week of Passion Week. Now, as we turn to the next page, 397, now we go to um, uh, another discussion where we're talking about the Son of Man's judgment. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. Now, that is in Jerusalem, the same Jerusalem we know today. Not a new Jerusalem. That is the Jerusalem we know today. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Now, he's not saying that he's judging each nation as a collective group. He's saying all the people from all the nations, when he comes back at the end of the tribulation, He's going to be judging everybody alive on earth at that time, and he's going to be setting them aside as precious sheep or unuseful goats. He'll make that separation. The purpose for the separation is the sheep. He sets them aside to begin his kingdom called the millennial reign here on earth. Those that are not of him will then be dismissed into a place of torment until the judgment comes. All right. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, a, a position of recognition and power and authority, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now, this is a plan that went into effect before God created earth. God already knew this. He already saw this. He already made plans for it. Nothing that happens from creation up until that time, nothing surprises him. And when you see how you fit into that eternal plan from creation until the reign of Jesus, when you see where you fit in, coming back and reigning with him because you demonstrated a life of faithfulness that demonstrated the life of his spirit in you while you lived here on earth that puts you in a position of being a useful servant, a useful vessel containing his message. He says, This has been prepared for you from the foundation of the world, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and 
and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of my brethren, you did it to me. Now, notice he didn't introduce this subject with likened to. Now he's talking about actual things that's going to occur. And he's talking to his disciples. So is it, is it limited to his disciples? Or is it limited to in the people who helped the disciples during the apostolic age? Or is it applicable to all believers? And it's applicable during this age. Well, there's room for discussion in that. But let's not get into that. Let's just find out what is it that he's wanting to teach us. Then he will say, he will also say to those on the left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will answer, uh, also answer, him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister you? Then he will answer them saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to the one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So there's no question here whether what we're talking about. We're talking about the judgment of eternity here. Notice there's no second chances once he shows up. Notice this is either eternal bliss or it's an eternal punishment. And that brings us to the end of his discourse where he was explaining this is the way it's going to be when I return. So what is he saying? He's not saying work salvation, but what he's saying is, is those who are truly redeemed and they see the brethren, they will not let the brethren go without. They will not let the brethren suffer without them coming to their aid. They will be living a life like Jesus, reaching out and investing into the lives of others. Now, some would say that's just reaching out to all humanity. I saw the poor out there and I fed them. That's not what he's saying here, though. If you look at the bottom of page 397, he says, you did it to the least of these my brethren. Now, if you're talking about the time of Jesus, then you could say, well, that would just be his apostles. If you're talking about shortly after that, and maybe it was as broad as to the whole nation of Israel as his brethren, maybe, then that would mean that you'd be reaching out to Jewish people who were struggling, okay? But if you consider this in Galatians 3, that we've been grafted into the promises of Abraham, and we are joint heirs with Christ, and I think that's probably the best way we should interpret that today as we reach out to fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, as we reach out to church members. We're responsible to take care of each other as church members. Now, I know we live in a country where there's social security and, and there's a socialistic style of medicine and everything, but that aside, church members are responsible to take care of church members. That's what sets us apart different from the world. Well, that brings us to the end of Tuesday night during Passion Week. Now let's start Wednesday morning, page 399. And in the daytime, he was teaching in the temple, but at night he went out and he stayed on the mountain called Olivet. That was a daily routine teaching. He'd come down off the mountain, go across the Kidron Valley, through the, the Garden of Gethsemane, come right up into the eastern gate that led up into the eastern uh, portion of the temple. He would teach there, and then he'd come right back down across the valley, right back up in the evening, and he would sleep looking down on the temple. I want you to notice this. In Passion Week, aside from the time that he took his disciples to the upper room to have a quiet moment with them, as far as we know, during Passion Week, as soon as he entered in, he was either on the temple plaza, around the temple, or he was on the Mount of Olives looking down onto the temple because that was the special place. All right. 
Then early in the morning, all the people came to him in the temple to hear him. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew near, which is called Passover. Now these two, pass oh, this Passover and, and Unleavened Bread, they're really kind of synonymous. Technically, Passover was one day, and it was a commemorance of the night that the death angel entered into Egypt and killed the firstborn of every house, lest the appropriate sacrificial blood was on the doorpost and lintel of the homes. All right? That was commemorating it, and they commemorated it every year, and that was wise of God to do that because even up until today, since God rescued the nation of Israel out of Egypt, every year they have recognized Passover. So there's never been a generation where it kind of faded away and nobody knows for sure, is this the right time or is this something that really happened? Is this a folklore? The nation of Israel has never missed one Passover day since the time of Moses. That's a long time, folks. <clears throat> Evidence, again, that the things that happened um, in Egypt and the 40 years of wandering, they're true and they're not hearsay. So Passover is one day, and then you have six days after that, a total of a seven-day, one-week-long festival celebration. And the rest of it was called the Festival of Unleavened Bread. And the Unleavened Bread was a representative of I want you to prepare a special bread before you leave to go into the wilderness, and I want it to have no leaven in it, no yeast that would make it rise up, kind of like a, a cracker or communion bread, and I want that to be symbolic of, I want you to leave your sin out too. Don't take sin from Egypt with you. Leave it behind. Become a holy and a desecrated people. It was great symbology. They didn't do it, but I mean, they didn't leave their sin behind, but, but they did recognize the giving of the holiday. Now, it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these things that he said to his disciples, you know that after two days, so if this is Wednesday, then he's talking about Friday. After two days is the Passover. That was the Passover day. And the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. So we know what day Jesus was crucified. There's no question about that. Then the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and plotted how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people, for they feared the people. Caiaphas being the high priest, we know from excavation, we know where his house was, and we have a recognition for it, and the Orthodox Church actually has a church there, and um, if you were to look up on it, um, it's designated, the building is designated by a rooster, because that's where Peter would have been when the rooster crowed three times. Caiaphas's house is not disputed. Everybody knows where it is. Archaeologists agree where it is. And it's interesting, there was a pit that was held for prisoners that's been unexcavated and um, that's been excavated, <laughs> it's been unearthed. And that was a holding area for people who are awaiting trial of the high priest. And you can still walk down into that pit, by the way. It's been restored. And there's just a, a wonderful, wonderful chance that Jesus was in that very same pit. And you can go down and experience that, too, if you get the chance to, to visit in Jerusalem. So Caiaphas has been, he's had this job for years, probably one of the longest um, high priests. And he inherited it from his father-in-law, Anna, and, and just, just a real political um, politically connected family that's been in charge. They are the aristocracy. And every time we see Caiaphas, we see this loathing. He hates Jesus. Probably because Caiaphas is benefiting greatly from being the high priest financially. And uh, he doesn't want to give up this power. And he, uh, he certainly sees Jesus as a threat. And he's saying, we've got to get rid of him. But the people said, if we cause a riot, it's going to be bad, and a lot of us could be unseated. And in the last paragraph, then Satan entered Jesus, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. So he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and the captains how he might betray him to them. 
And Judas said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And when they heard it, they were glad, and they agreed to give him money, and they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. So from that time, he sought opportunity for how he might conveniently betray Christ to them in the absence of the multitude. And of course, we know how that happened. We know that um, he took a quiet moment out to the Garden of Gethsemane when the crowds weren't around, and that was the time that he went and he identified him and said, I'm now state's evidence against this man. And there was nobody there to defend him except for Peter, and of course we'll get to that soon too. Now that takes us up through Wednesday, and um, we'll be studying next time on page 401 as it's the beginning of the Passover. So um, I'm supposing that uh, there were things that's happening between that Wednesday and the Passover, and probably just more of the same, but we just don't have the details. So I trust that this has been um, a source of knowledge for you, that it's a source of encouragement when you see how Jesus with certainty talks about things in the future so that you and I will not be caught off guard. And it kind of raises our anticipation and our excitement level to where we just want to serve him greater. And I trust that's what uh, your heart desires to do. Be a greater servant. Invest more into his church, into the furtherance of the gospel, into your discipleship. Invest money in training, invest money into classes, invest time into coming to Wednesday and Sunday night Bible studies, and, and just find yourself growing, and then find yourself teaching and loving others. We're supposed to love him, but we're all supposed to love one another also. So let us be found acquiring and placing our treasures in heaven, not here on earth. All right? Well, I trust that you'll have a blessed day, and until then, uh, we get together next time. I just, uh, I just trust that uh, you will be found faithful. Until then, may God bless.